There was an age when more than one out of three people born on earth lived and died under the rule of one of two men, either the Roman or Han Chinese emperor. These ancient civilizations, situated at opposite ends of Eurasia, managed to dominate massive populations spread over a vast geographical area for many centuries. To do this, both empires developed different effective solutions to solve similar problems. The Roman and Han empires had some major differences, as well as some macro-level similarities. Both empires had populations of over 50 million people, massive economies, large territories, and a system with one main man at the top of the power structure. This video will examine the different strategies these ancient empires used to maintain authoritarian systems of control over a staggering percentage of the Earth's population. Part 1. The Emperor How one man came to rule so many, and the creation of the imperial system had very different causes in both Rome and China. In ancient Rome, the lower class's dissatisfaction with their increasingly corrupt oligarchic ruling class laid the groundwork for the overhaul of their system of government and the gradual acceptance of an autocrat. In ancient China, centuries of chaos and strife between warlords and petty kings created the desire for centralized power, which would bring peace, order, and harmony to their land. Immediately before the Han, the Qin dynasty briefly united China's squabbling states into a single empire. However, this empire was brutal, decadent, and only lasted 15 years before breaking up into 18 kingdoms. Large-scale war and atrocities returned. It must have seemed a new dark age was beginning. During this time, a peasant, turned bandit, rose to become the king of one of the 18 kingdoms. His name was Liu Bang, and after several years of civil war, he united the warring kingdoms and established the Han Empire. In contrast to the Han, who quickly emerged out of a chaotic period to form a stable state, Rome's rise was a relatively slow process. When Rome was founded, like most other small ancient city-states, it had a monarchy. After a couple hundred years, the Romans got sick of having a corrupt and abusive king ruling over their city. So they rose in revolt and abolished the monarchy. Instead of establishing a new royal family, the Romans set up a new form of government where representatives were elected to govern the city. This was the world's first republic. Rome was so economically and militarily successful that the relatively insignificant city grew to control all of the Italian peninsula, and then the Mediterranean world. The Roman Republic was a victim of its own success. Rome had an empire long before it had an emperor. And while many in the Roman Republic's ruling class became wealthier than some kings, the majority of Roman citizens saw little of the empire's bounty. In fact, many were impoverished and their land seized by a few wealthy families. Despite some reforms, tensions between the lower and the ruling class in Rome increased. Julius Caesar championed the cause of the poor and won a civil war. He was declared dictator for life and stabbed to death shortly after by senators who claimed he wanted to become a king. After another civil war, his adoptive son Octavian became the first emperor, Augustus. Throughout his long reign, Augustus's shrewd political maneuvering and a long series of new laws enacted allowed him to consolidate near-absolute power. A variety of pre-existing positions and powers that had previously been held by several elected officials who were regularly rotated out of office came to be permanently held by the emperor. The power of the old republic's institutions, like the senate, were gradually diminished, and some were eventually abolished. Over time, later in the empire, the Senate became a rubber stamp for imperial decrees, and was staffed only with hand-picked yes-men chosen by the Emperor. Rome's first Emperor Augustus spent his lifetime fighting, persuading, or coercing his political rivals and the public into giving him more power. The fact that the Romans pretended to have vestiges of a republic for so long is testament to the Romans' traditional distaste for kings and one man holding absolute power for life. In contrast, Liu Bang, who was born a peasant, near the bottom of Chinese society's social structure, was aided by the concept of the Mandate of Heaven. This philosophy had been established more than 800 years before the Han Dynasty, when the cruel and oppressive Shang Dynasty was overthrown by the Zhou Dynasty. It was believed that there was a natural order to the universe, and to maintain order, spiritual forces expressed their will by granting the Mandate of Heaven to a just ruler 
the Son of Heaven. This ruler was supposed to care more about his people than himself. He was an autocrat of unquestioned authority in all realms of Han society. He was supreme lawgiver, chief judge, priest, and military commander. Because the emperor was believed to express the will of the universe through his actions, his subjects were obliged to display unquestioning obedience to him. That is, so long as he had the favor of heaven. Prosperity was a sign that the ruler was favored by heaven, and natural disasters, famine, and suffering of the people were signed that heaven disapproved of his leadership. If a ruler was not favored by heaven, the people had the right to rebel, like Liu Bang had done. Because he won the civil war, showed that heaven favored him, and his descendants had the right to rule, as long as things went well, which they did more often than not. The Liu family ruled in China for more than 400 years, with one brief interruption. Part 1.5 The Succession Problem All 30 Han emperors were from the Liu family. In contrast to the Han, the Romans didn't keep it all in the family for very long. That is, after the first five emperors were all from Augustus' family, even though they were all related, none ascended to the imperial throne because they were the biological son of the previous emperor. Instead, like Augustus, who was adopted by the ruling dictator, three of his successors were adopted by the ruling emperor and inherited the throne that way. Claudius is the first example of the other most common manner of Roman succession, assassination. After Caligula was assassinated by his elite personal bodyguard, called the Praetorian Guard, they declared his reluctant uncle Claudius emperor. Although a few sons did succeed their father as emperor, it was the accepted norm in the Roman Empire that the reigning emperor could nominate whoever he wanted as his successor. This was made official by formally adopting the successor. Commonly, imperial powers or positions, like Tribune of the Plebs, were given while the former emperor was still living to ease the intended successor into the role. While assassination, palace coup d'etat, and military intervention were all extremely common, violent transitions were typically quick and usually didn't affect the common people too much. The Roman Emperor's adoption system allowed in ideal circumstances for capable and competent leaders unrelated to the current emperor to be chosen. The most successful example of this system working is the period of time at the end of the Pax Romana when the commonly called five good emperors ruled. The good times ended when the philosopher emperor, Marcus Aurelius, chose his mildly insane son Commodus as his successor. Both the Romans and the Han had systems that did not automatically make the oldest born male son the default successor, which has commonly been the system for many autocracies in history. Just like the Roman Emperor, who could choose his own successor, the Han Emperor could choose his own successor as well. He just had more limited options. He had to keep it in the family, but luckily for him, his family was gigantic. Although a Han Emperor only had one official wife, the Empress, to increase the odds of the emperor producing a male heir, the imperial state maintained a massive harem of hundreds and in some cases thousands of women. Life was extremely competitive in the bizarre world of the harem. The concubines, consorts, and ladies of the harem were divided up into a complex ranking system. Depending on a woman's rank in the harem, her extended family outside of the palace walls could receive additional money, positions, prestige, and opportunities. A woman could rise in rank if the emperor favored her, if she bore a son, or through the help of a higher ranking woman. Often, the most powerful woman in the palace, who could make or break any woman of the harem's whole career, was the emperor's mother, the dowager empress. In cases where the emperor's grandmother was still alive, the grand empress dowager would be the most powerful woman in the palace and the country. The harem system often produced many sons to pick a successor from. Consequently, the competition in the harem to get one son chosen was intense and vicious. Based on the favor or whims of an emperor, a younger son, grandchild, or even nephew could ascend to the throne. When the emperor was too lazy, young, or unexpectedly died, the dowager empress, or highest ranking female in the palace, often picked the next emperor. In the later Han Empire, this became increasingly common as the emperor's power waned. Part 2. The Problem with Rivals So. In a society with one guy on top, many people are going to want to topple, control, or replace the guy on top. So who were these people in ancient Rome and Han society? Provincial governors and generals were the most common usurpers during Imperial Rome. 
As mentioned before, in Han China, the most common usurpers were other Liu family members, with the one exception of Wang Mang. In ancient Rome, deposing an emperor usually took the form of the guy getting Gaius Julius Caesar type treatment on the pointy end of a sharp piece of metal. In ancient China, the name of the game was to control the emperor, not stab him. Throughout the Han Empire, but especially in the later Han Empire, young children were often placed on the imperial throne. Because of their youth and inexperience, they were easier to manipulate by whichever faction had placed them there. Frequently, empresses or dowager empresses were the key figures who selected and manipulated a young emperor. Once their desired puppet was installed on the throne, the empress's family members would be given most of the top government positions. The power transition between an empress dowager's family running the show and a younger ambitious empress's family taking over frequently led to the slaughter of one of their clans. Other factions in Han society that played a role in trying to select or control the emperor were the massive state bureaucracy, the palace eunuchs, and in the very late Han Empire, warlords. During Imperial Rome, the army, the Praetorian Guard, and the Senate were three groups an aspiring Roman emperor usually needed on his side in order to seize power. Public support from the city of Rome's massive population was also an important factor. And even though the Roman Senate had been stripped of most of its power, it played a large role in legitimizing any usurper, as the venerable institution was prestigious and still widely respected by the people. The emperor's personal bodyguard, the Praetorian Guard, was the only military unit allowed within the city of Rome. They were tasked with protecting the emperor, but they also frequently killed the emperor. So, having those guys like you was important, and they were frequently lavished with gifts and large cash bonuses. However, the most important faction in Roman society an emperor needed to keep favor with was the massive Roman army, which popular generals or provincial governors could use to usurp the imperial throne. Part 2.5 The Problem with Governors or the problem with having a big empire. Having a big empire with wildly varying terrain types filled with many people of different cultures makes governing the whole thing really hard for one guy to do. So, both of these empires had a similar solution. They divided the empire up into provinces, each administered by a governor. In the Roman Empire, these governors were called legate or legatus and were appointed directly by the emperor to rule on his behalf in imperial provinces. Governors of provinces administered by the senate were called proconsuls. Although appointed by the senate, they were still approved of by the emperor in a roundabout way. Additionally, to prevent corruption, a position called procurator was responsible for the finances and tax collection in a province. Procurators directly reported to the emperor, some smaller provinces were governed by procurators instead of legatus. Excluding finances, the empire's governors had near dictatorial powers. To mitigate the potential for rebellious governors, they were only given short terms in a province, which, depending on the emperor, was usually somewhere between one to four years. The Han Empire had a different philosophy regarding governors, which was shaped by the country's traumatic past, where for centuries, warlords held the land in their grasp. Governors became rebel kings and warlords in China's past. Consequently, the Han Empire limited their powers. There were two types of governors in Han imperial history, either called circuit inspectors or shepherds. Usually there were around a little more than a dozen of them. Similar to Roman governors, they were appointed by the emperor. However, they did not directly report to the emperor. Instead, they were a cog in the wheel of Chinese bureaucracy. Inspectors reported to the Grand Secretary, or to all three of the emperor's chief ministers. As the name implies, an inspector's duties were mainly to inspect. The administrators, magistrates, chancellors, and even petty kings in a province. He recommended actions to those below him, and reported back to the ministers above him. Based off of his quality of work and findings, he, or anyone who reported to him, could be promoted, demoted, fired, or prosecuted and executed. Han governors more often than not had no power regarding military matters, except in the case of rebellion. Then they were empowered to command, arm, and raise a militia of local reservists. Near the end of the Han Empire, this system broke down, and several governors raised private armies and became warlords. Part 3. The Problem with the Army So, to conquer, defend, and control a huge empire, an emperor needed many soldiers. The Roman Empire had a massive professional standing army of Roman citizens 
supported by non-citizen auxiliary troops and the Roman navy. In all, their numbers approximately fluctuated between 300,000 and half a million men. This force was maintained in times of peace and war. It was incredibly successful at conquering, crushing revolts, and extremely effective at protecting the empire's borders. It was also incredibly expensive to maintain, and was extremely effective at removing Roman emperors from the throne. Consequently, many Roman emperors became far more concerned with keeping the army and the Praetorian Guard happy than their own people. So, the massive standing army solved the problems of the outward threat of foreign invasion and the inward threat of internal revolt, but the army itself became a problem. Like their Roman counterparts, Chinese emperors could marshal armies of hundreds of thousands of troops. Compared to Roman military doctrine, Han policy was far more concerned with the internal threat the army itself posed to the state and emperor. So they developed a system where they could bring overwhelming force to bear when needed, defend the frontier, and minimize the potential for generals using the army to seize power. It was standard procedure for each army to be commanded by two generals, and the general's time in command was short. The generals were given different tasks and were often chosen to be rivals. They were regularly rotated out so they would have little time to conspire. Most infantrymen usually didn't stick around long either. All able-bodied men in the Han Empire were required when called upon to perform one year military training and one additional year of guard duty, which was usually on the northern frontier. Most men were trained in the use of spears, pikes, halberds, and or crossbows. A tax could be paid to avoid military service, however, most could not afford to pay it. Consequently, the Han Empire had a vast pool of many hundreds of thousands of reservists who had some military experience. When needed, these men could be quickly called back into service and armed. Conscripts or militia could serve much longer than a year if a prolonged conflict broke out. In addition to conscript troops and provincial reserve militia, the Han also had military colonists and convict soldiers. Han settlers on the frontier were the only commoners in the empire who were armed at all times, as they had to be ready to fend off nomadic incursions. In Han China, some convicts could choose to serve their sentences in the army. They were often put in support roles and given the most labor-intensive tasks. After their sentence had been completed, many convicts decided to stay in the army, as it was a steady job and their social standing increased. Over time, prisoners, juvenile delinquents, vagabonds, and other undesirables were increasingly rounded up and used to fill the ranks of the army. These soldiers pressed into service gradually became the majority of the empire's infantry, replacing conscript troops. Because they generally served longer, they became more skilled soldiers, and removing the criminal element from the country's cities and towns was a side benefit. The Han Empire's large cavalry force was primarily composed of volunteers from the Han nobility and allied non-Chinese steppe people like the Xianbei, who lived on the outskirts of the empire. Throughout Han Imperial history, the only constant professional standing army in the empire was called the Northern Army. They were the best trained and equipped. They were tasked with guarding the capital city. During the reigns of some emperors like Wu, campaigns were so long and constant, the army was essentially a professional standing army. However, in times of peace, the army was dramatically scaled back. This changed in the late Han Empire when professional soldiers became common, and, as earlier Han emperors had feared, generals and governors became warlords. Given their most likely threats, ancient Chinese and Romans made different rational choices. The Romans decided they wanted the best possible fighting force to be available at all times to counter incursion from the north or invasion from the east. The Chinese realized they were their own greatest threat, so they decided they wanted the best possible fighting force that had safeguards against rebellion. Like all empires, they both eventually failed, but it is remarkable how long both were successful. Part 4. The Problem with People The Roman and Han empires control many of the most fertile and densely populated regions on earth. Each emperor can marshal hundreds of thousands of troops to their command. But soldiers alone are not enough to efficiently control populations of many millions of people. Soldiers could keep the people of the land safe from external threats. But safety is not the only need of a large population. The iconic Roman phrase, bread and circuses, refers to two of the Roman government's top priorities, to provide their people with food and entertainment. And the Romans took their entertainment to a brutal, extravagant extreme. Many thousands of men 
and a wide variety of animals were killed in front of massive cheering crowds in arenas throughout the empire every year. In addition to ensuring their people were properly amused, the Roman state prioritized keeping their bellies full. In their massive capital city of Rome, hundreds of thousands received free bread every day, paid for by the state. The Romans learned from past experience the number one thing that will cause the common people to revolt is an empty stomach. On the opposite side of Eurasia, it was also recognized that an empty stomach led to revolt. The vast majority of China's population lived in the fertile river valleys around the Yangtze and Yellow Rivers. In most years, the land produced a surplus of food. Wheat was grown in the north and rice in the south. The Han Chinese were masters of irrigation and farming. However, severe drought and or flooding that periodically occurred there could cause devastating famine. Most Han emperors maintained a disaster relief fund of stored food and cash to help mitigate the suffering of the people in bad times. Some emperors in times of famine granted tax amnesty to the peasants and decreed that the common people could fish or hunt for food anywhere in the land, which was normally not allowed. Weak, corrupt, and or incompetent emperors at the end of the Eastern and Western Han periods did not maintain their disaster relief funds and did little to satiate the hunger of the masses when crisis struck. This mismanagement led to massive popular uprisings. The two largest rebellions were the Red Eyebrow Rebellion and the Yellow Turban Rebellion. The Red Eyebrow Rebellion led to the overthrow of two emperors, the usurper Wang Mang and the next Han Emperor, before they were defeated. The Yellow Turban Rebellion lasted for a staggering 21 years and triggered events that led to the downfall of the Han Empire. Part 4.5 More Problems with People In order to control more than 50 million people, an empire needs to have some rules, and a system to enforce those rules. The ancient Romans and Chinese had different approaches to this problem. Both empires were similar in that they had extensive law codes and bureaucracies, but the Romans relied more on their legal system while the Han relied more on their bureaucrats. Roman law had a good reputation for being fair and just. Consequently, it was generally well received by conquered peoples. In the Roman system, the emperor delegated his power through relationships to surrogates, like a governor, and the governor further delegated to his surrogates. This system of executives who delegated their duty downwards kept the size of Roman government pretty small. In contrast, the Han system had an army of more than 130,000 bureaucrats working in the civil service. The civil service was resupplied by the Imperial Academy, which had 30,000 students. In ancient Rome, one could raise their social station through commerce or through the military. Throughout Roman history, several people of lower class backgrounds rose to become emperor. In Han China, the civil service was the primary means to improve one's station in life. The Chinese invented mass standardized testing for their civil service exam, where nervous test takers might get a question like this. Those bright enough to score high enough would be hired for a one-year probationary period. If they did well, they kept their job. To reduce corruption, they had to move away from their home province. Civil servants received a performance review every three years, and if it was favorable, they could rise in rank and salary. As you might expect, the children of the wealthy and the nobility typically were the ones that passed the test, as they had access to study materials, tutors, and had more time to study. Even so, many from the poorest segments of society rose to the top. In one prominent example, a pig farmer became the Grand Chancellor, second in power only to the Emperor. Other than rising through the bureaucratic ranks, social mobility in the Empire was minimal. The official state religion of the Han Empire was Confucianism. Confucianism stresses morality, moderation, and respect for authority, exemplified by the reciprocal duties between family, friends, and ruler. Other religions were tolerated, as long as Confucian principles were practiced, and Confucianism was not optional. The Trung Sisters' rebellion in Vietnam was triggered in part by the Han Chinese reorganizing their society to be in accord with Confucian principles. In the Roman Empire, religion was more of a choose-your-own-adventure and was a largely personal affair. The Romans loved religion and couldn't get enough of it. In addition to their state-sponsored pantheon of gods, they were always adopting new ones from other people they came in contact with. They were tolerant of most religions, with a few exceptions. After persecuting Christianity on and off for a long while, the Romans ditched their pantheon of gods in favor of one god. This came after a chaotic century of military anarchy 
and the empire temporarily being split in two, Constantine reunited the empire. Rome had one god, one empire, and one emperor. Later, the western half of the empire broke off and died. But a Christian Rome, without a Rome, lived on until 1453. But that is another matter. One more big difference between the two empires is that the Roman Empire had a lot of slaves. During the height of Rome's power, in a period of time called the Principate, it is estimated that somewhere between 10 and 30% of the population of the Roman Empire were slaves. In stark contrast, only around 1% of the population of Han China were slaves. And most of those slaves were enslaved because they were criminals. So out of the mechanisms for preserving power that these empires used, which was the most and least effective? Let me know down in the comments. It will be really interesting to see what you have to say. This has been Epimetheus. The biggest of thanks to my patrons, who support making videos like this. And to you, awesome person who made it to the end of the video.